Meet Ground Views, a citizen journalism website created by this man, Sanjana, the first attempt in Sri Lanka to create a way for citizens to share their views on the war, call out humanitarian emergencies and security conditions, and debate alternatives. Meet again Rachel Brown, who's right here, who was here today. Yes, Rachel Brown created Peace Text at, at Sisi Niamani, um, which uses, as you heard today, mobile messaging to help stop deadly violence in communities in Kenya. Meet Luino Robillard, who's using crowdsourced mapping in Haiti's Cite Soleil slums to place solar powered lights strategically to reduce gender and gang violence. And Dishad, who you also met earlier. I don't know if Dishad's still here today. Dishad is the brilliant mind behind AIMTA, the um, a mobile app that tracks the trajectory of missiles um, and sends out a warning to those in its path. Meet the Enough Project, if you haven't heard it, you probably have, because it's funded in part by George Clooney and it used satellite imagery to track John Jawid terror in Darfur region of Sudan. And the Lord's Resistance Army Tracker, the LRA Tracker, being used in Congo to try and catch Joseph Kony. Meet Yala, an online network of Israeli and Palestinian youth to promote peaceful problem solving. Meet Aggie, who was created by this guy, Michael Best, a social media aggregator and monitoring software countering hate speech and election violence in Africa. Meet Frontline SMS and Ken Banks, who created this tool to reach populations in danger, Frontline SMS, via text message. This is PeaceTech. Innovations in data, in technology, and in media, born out of the danger of violent conflicts. Innovate or be silenced. Innovate or be shelled. Innovate or be imprisoned. Innovate or die. Conflict has often been a crucible for innovation. The internet, for goodness sakes, was born out of DARPA in the Department of Defense. But this burst of innovation that I tried to capture in that run, in the run that we had at the start of the day, this burst of innovation in new approaches to tackling age-old drivers of violence is, as I think you heard in that panel as well, it's unprecedented in human history. So you'd think that these would be the best of times in our field, but they are most certainly not from Ukraine to Afghanistan, from Iraq to Gaza. Conflict reigns, and nearly every recent study on the role of technology in preventing or resolving its causes is ambivalent at best. So this was a recent NDI study um, of nine countries, the use of technology for civic participation, its conclusion, little data available on the impacts. Another study by IPI, terrific study on a conflict prevention and technology, potential rather than results. Another study by Transparency International recently about the use of ICTs for corruption, tackling corruption. Little evidence, but positive signs. Why is this? What's needed to increase the real impact of peace tech in conflict zones? As the nation's center for conflict resolution and peace building, we at USIP, we have a responsibility, indeed we've got this charge from Congress that I mentioned at the start of the day, to answer that question. So for more than five years, our team here at USIP, and it really has been a team effort, working in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in South Sudan, in Burma, with experts and activists alike, and their answers to this question, how can peace tech be more impactful, have provided the inspiration for USIP's new Peace Tech Lab and the four pillars on which it will be based. Convene, connect, build, and inspire. Let me break these down. Convene. Conflict, we know, is about complex human dynamics, which are often culturally specific. So we've heard time and time again that effective solutions require deep local knowledge of the conflict, the geography, and the technology environment. So the Peace Tech Lab needs to be a model of radical collaboration across disciplines, across technology platforms, and across generations. Engineers and technologists working every day alongside experts on peace building. Data scientists working alongside social scientists. It will have Peace Tech fellows from the conflict zones 
themselves and a young engineers program to ensure intergenerational collaboration. So we're making sure we're drawing upon the talents of young people like this. This is Marion Bechtel, a 17 year old, who drew upon her piano lessons to come up with a new way to find landmines using sonar. Young people relate differently to technology. And I don't know if any of you saw this study not too long ago by, I think it was commissioned by Intel. It's fascinating. It talked about how people over 25, on average, ring the doorbell with their forefinger. And people under 25, on average, ring the doorbell with their thumb. The dominant digit is changing. But it also talks, it speaks volumes about the different ways the next generation, and I know this from coming home every day to my kids, how they connect with technology is totally different from other generations. The next pillar of the lab is connect. Speed matters, as you see from those stunning numbers that are coming up. And the probability of reaching nonviolent solutions instead of military ones are highest in what's called the early gestation phase of a conflict. So imagine the lab as a data hub, having partnerships with social media and big data companies, developing early warning mechanisms that can alert our in-country partners to imminent threats and life-saving information so they can take early action. And USIP has a huge network of country partners it's developed over the last 30 years, as do so many of the organizations that we've heard about today. So that's the vision for the lab's open situation room exchange. You heard about it earlier from Noel. This town is full of closed situation rooms in government, right? White House has one, DOD has one, State Department has one. Ours has to be an open, working, 24-7 operation that monitors tweets, YouTube uploads, most importantly, proactively connects with our civil society partners in the field over video Skype, whether it's WhatsApp or chat or whatever platform works best. Because we live today in a world where the internet gets uploads from battle zones before the generals themselves know about it. And the lab needs to be connected to that dynamic nature of conflict with a working rhythm as urgent as war itself if we are going to really provide timely assistance in our field. But we also know we're going to need private sector know-how to get there because that's where big data has been influencing decision making for well over a decade. We have so far to go to catch up in our field. So we need to make sure we're bringing the private sector know-how into our work with big data. Which brings me to a third attribute of the lab, and that is the build piece. So unlike most tech developers in the West, the lab has to be focused, like a laser, on building solutions for those 1G, low bandwidth, low power, and dangerous environments where violence occurs. We heard time and time again how local technologists, the hackers, and the coders in conflict zones are frustrated with technology they really can't use. Sometimes it's a lack of documentation in local languages. We heard a little bit about that this morning. And sometimes it's that smartphone app in a dumb phone world. Right now, too much peace tech gets built without intimate knowledge of those local constraints. So imagine bringing together a mobile phone specialist from Motorola, an election specialist from Afghanistan to collaborate on using USIP's preventing election violence curriculum and turning it into a mobile phone application for voter ed. And what we learned doing this for Afghanistan, we know we can then apply in Burma or in Nigeria or the next election in a conflict zone because we know that elections are often flashpoints for violence. We understand that as one of the causes of violence. And this needs to set the lab apart from other innovation labs around the world. Instead of creating new to the world tools, bending electrons like they do in so many other of the new innovation labs, we need to be looking for gaps that can be filled by adopting, mashing up, hacking off the self, low cost consumer technologies for local consumption. And we'll also be nurturing other builders to do exactly the same by providing startup grants as well as space for incubating peace tech startups who can prototype this in with this input we can provide from the field. Finally, the fourth pillar of the peace tech lab, and really our most important one, really, the North Star for what we're going to be doing, and kind of the subtext from so much of what was talked about here today. That's inspire, as in 
inspire an industry. Or put another way, we need to scale this work far beyond the projects that we've got listed there, the projects that we showed earlier, that we had earlier in the lightning rounds. As one of our leading activists in this field, Hel Helena Puge put it, co-founder of the Build Peace Conference, she wrote, pilot projects are popular and common in, tech for the, in, in the tech for peace field. Great for uncovering new ideas, but most don't have rigorous measures and often lack the support to scale up. So how do we change this and scale up to realize the potential impact of peace tech? Let me suggest that the answer is not where you'd expect. It was about 100 years ago that the US government turned for help to the private sector, and specifically to research labs like those pioneered by Thomas Edison, George Westinghouse, because the tools of national defense, from automatic firearms and mechanized armor to aircraft and missiles, they required increasingly specialized knowledge and technology in order to build them. And the defense industry was born. But today's conflicts require a different kind of strategy and a different kind of specialized knowledge. And if you don't believe me, listen to what the guys who are fighting these wars are saying. Secretary Gates, we must focus our energies beyond the guns and steel of the military. Admiral Mullen, US foreign policy is still too dominated by the military, too dependent upon the generals and admirals. General Petraeus, any conceivable operation in the future is still going to have to support the establishment of local governance, rule of law capability, foster economic development, counter corruption, train host nation security forces, and reintegrate reconcilable belligerents. These leaders and many others are asking really tough questions, important questions about why we're spending over $2 trillion in Iraq and Afghanistan, and that's really a fairly conservative estimate, and not getting the results we all want. They know that conflicts are increasingly localized, fragmented, and culturally specific, and yet, how do we seek to resolve them? Some say, follow the money. 500 billion for defense, 46.2 billion for both diplomacy and development. Wait, 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 don't forget the annual appropriations of the nation's Global Conflict Management Center, USIP. Did you, see, did you catch that? Did you see the move? If you, if you blinked, you might have missed our 39, 39 million there. As a nation, our predominant method of conflict resolution is still war tech. And it hasn't been working. The alternative, as Secretary Gates and Admiral Mullins suggest, is to shift our focus beyond the guns and steel to a strategy like P-Tech, Peace Tech, that is, a much lower investment of capital than conventional war fighting. That's built by entrepreneurs themselves from the conflict zones. That's self-organized and mobilized by sheer necessity, and that's adaptable and deployable and rapidly deployable according to changing local conditions. Now, some of you might think that what I'm suggesting here is that we redirect monies from the defense budget into things like the Peace Tech Lab, and I am not, though I wouldn't say no to a billion or two. Um, and I'm quite sure, by the way, that by demonstrating greater success in preventing conflict as a field than we have to date through initiatives like the Peace Tech Lab, that we will attract greater government funding and grow the pie for the Peace Tech field in general. I'm sure of that. But more government funding is not a viable strategy in today's world. Actually, we're suggesting something really different that we developed the Peace Tech Lab from the very start in order to learn from what DOD has done with unparalleled success, and that is they spawned an industry. What can we learn from one of the most enduring partnerships in history between the military and the private sector in order to inspire this, the Peace Tech industry? Why, for example, did governments continue to invest in private sector defense contractors, even after the major wars were over. 
One reason I already mentioned, it was that specialized technology that was required, but the other factor was even more powerful. And again, it's kind of in the subtext of a lot of things people have said today. Because the defense industry became a major employer in nearly every part of America. And when an industry puts people to work, governments and corporations, large and small, invest in it. So let's think of the Peace Tech Lab as a way to inspire an industry where people innovate and build products that both save lives and alleviate unemployment, which as you've heard today is currently of epidemic proportions in most conflict zones, particularly among young men. Creating such an industry obviously begins like any other, that is identifying critical needs and the buyers who are willing to pay for the products and services that meet those needs. So what kinds of critical needs do Peace Tech products and services meet, right? This is all about buyers and sellers. And what I said earlier, the three big business lines would be tech, media, and data. So data, think about that. The conflict zone data the lab collects in order to analyze and better anticipate violence during the elections in, say, Nigeria or Congo, that information has a great deal of value to companies like Shell or Chevron that are doing business there, or in HP and Intel who need to know about their supply chains and getting minerals out of the ground. When it comes to tech, the peace tech industry might create mobile devices that can protect local activists from the prying eyes of dictators. In fact, we're already seeing some really, really innovative products coming out of the peace tech field to do that. You may have heard of the Librio tablet, the Guardian project uh, developed Librio tablet to allow activists to surf the web anonymously and safely. Why not think about making those products available in Best Buy media. The Peace Tech field has already launched a number of successful TV and radio shows. Just ask Search for Common Ground about their hit show Nashimalo in the Balkans or the team in Kenya. USIP has One Village, A Thousand Voices, our radio drama in Afghanistan is doing very well in Sawa Shabab in South Sudan, and we've got a reality TV show in Iraq. Why not think about marketing strategies behind them just like those used by other nonprofit media companies that are intent on social change and making money. Sesame Workshops come to mind. National Geographic is another. I could go on and on because these three business lines have countless products and services within them and customers who are willing to pay for them. We just haven't thought about it this way yet. And that's one of the things we will be doing in the lab. Now you see our plan for world domination. And it begins with a Peace Tech lab that's designed specifically to bolster the impact of the Peace Tech potential that we know, we all know is there. A lab that's designed for specifically for the nature of conflict today, a world where anyone can send information around the globe with a push of a button using those cell phones that are nearly ubiquitous. Even in Afghanistan, where there's 65% illiteracy, 72% cell phone penetration. Folks have been talking about that all day. A lab that's designed for those four principles. Convene for radical collaboration. Connect for speed and agility. Build for local adoption. And inspire a global industry. We actually have a good foundation. The team here has already begun to build the largest online network of young Iraqi peace builders to design. They've also worked on designing tools to crowd map attacks on journalists. They're working with local Burmese to develop systems to track and counter hate speech. But we know we have a long way to go to scale this kind of work as we've been describing. And we're going to need a lot of help to do that. So we invite you, go to that URL, um, you'll be able to see how to get in touch with us to provide your input, to provide your ideas, to ask questions, contact us about the Peace Tech Lab. As I said, we need you to join us in creating the Peace Tech Lab as well as in starting to create a global industry.